It's good to see everybody out on this wonderful day. We all got rain. Hopefully nobody had any kind of damage. Just the wonderful rain that we all needed. And if you would, please, we're going to start our singing tonight with 290. Be with me, Lord. 290. Will you bow with me? Our Heavenly Father, God Almighty, we thank you for another day of life. We thank you for the blessing of the rain, replenishing our earth. We thank you for being in your presence, replenishing our souls as we gather together to study more about your love for us and how we should love you. Pray that you'll be with Charles, with the lessons that he's prepared. Help us to pay attention, to interact, to also, as he's told us many times, to learn something. Something new, something that can encourage or fortify or strengthen our faith. We pray that you'll be with those that are unable to be out, those that are confined at home, those that are off at school. We pray that you'll be with Kelly as she continues to study, pursuing her goal. We also pray that you'll be with those that are facing surgeries or recovering, that you'll bless their health, let them regain their strength. Be with those that have lost loved ones, Lord, and we know this is a very difficult time. We ask that you, your healing hand comfort their hearts and strengthen them. Help us to be the brothers and sisters that they need. Lord, be with our nation. We know it's in turmoil. The world is. We pray that the proper leadership will get in place your selection for the right man for the job. We also pray and ask that you'll be with the people, men and women, that have chosen the life of the military to protect the freedoms that we all enjoy. And we pray that you'll bless them, whether they're here on CONUS or in foreign lands. Help them to complete their missions and be able to come home. Be with all of our sheriff's troopers and EMT specialists that are out dealing with tragedies, trying to help and assist other people. Help us to always remember our blessings and to count them, Lord, for we are a blessed people. Be with us as we continue to study. Watch over us. Protect us. It's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
All right, so wonderful to see everyone here tonight. So thankful for your presence. It's another beautiful day. God has spared our lives and allowed us this opportunity to be here tonight. I'm so thankful for those that are visiting with us. I'm glad that you could be with us tonight as well. And those that are watching online, thank you for being with us also. As we have been studying salvation, how important salvation is to each one of us, and I hope that you have considered the things that we have taught so far as something that interests you, whether it's to become a child of God or whether to be restored back to that first love if you already are a child of God and you wandered off back into sin. But we were asking the question, what does one need to know to be baptized? Do you remember some of the things that we talked about? What is it that one needs to know to be baptized? First, you got to understand that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, that he is the anointed one, the Christ, the son of the living God. That's number one. If you all have obeyed the gospel, that's number one, and that's the belief that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what you need to know. First off, how do you receive that knowledge? Well, from the Word, okay. And from the Word, why do you believe it? By faith. Faith is the basis, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Okay? Very important. You have to be taught, John 6, 44 and 45, to be taught. Christianity is a taught religion. Okay? You can read God's Word. You can understand it by what you read. And the basis of knowing that there are certain things that you need to understand. And you can learn about Christianity. But there are just some things that you have to be taught. But how is that? By the Word of God. Okay? What's number two? All right? You have to have faith. You have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. Number two. You, okay, believe, but then what? Once you believe, you have to repent, right? Repent. You all, you all obeyed the gospel. These are the things you need to know. Uh, don't make me pull out those index cards and have you write it down. I did that one time a while back, you know, and, and I said there's six, six steps to salvation. And uh, nobody could remember what the sixth step was. Now, David had seven, though. Huh? Stay faithful. The number six, that's right. Stay faithful. All right? So number two, you have to repent. Repent of what? Your sins. All right? You've been getting it wrong all this time. Now you're learning and understanding the truth of God's Word. So then you have to turn away from that. I think that, that that's one thing that is the hardest command for anyone to do. That is to turn away from sin. You've been sinning for 20 years, right? And then all of a sudden I come along, I'm teaching you this, and, and I'm saying, you know, whatever the things that you were doing, you can't do no more. And you're like, really? Well, what about this? Well, no, you can't do that. What about this? No, you can't do that anymore either. What does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says don't. Get away from it. It's what leading you down in the wrong direction. So repent. Number three, what's the third one? Confession. Okay, what do you have to confess? Your sins? No. No. You got to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You repented of your sins. You can't confess your sins unless you're already a child of God. Okay, so please understand that. Confession is confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, once you become a child of God and you have sinned, 
then you're to repent and confess your sins, okay, before God. All right? So, confession. You, what is the, what is the fourth thing? Baptism. Did we, did we kind of, no. Hear, believe, repent. We did say believe. Repent, confess, be baptized. All right, so, so, but I've already been baptized. Uh, you know, when I, when I grew up in the Catholic Church, they, they kind of poured water over my head, sprinkled water over my head, and so I've been baptized. That wasn't a baptism, because baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means what? Immersion, to dip, plunge, consume, all right? Nowhere in the Bible do you ever read about baptism where you're not consumed, right? You remember reading about the baptism of fire? When is that? On Judgment Day, for a lot of people, they're going to have the baptism. Well, they're going to be wholly consumed with fire in hell. That's the baptism of fire for those that are lost on Judgment Day. You don't want that, okay? If anything, you don't want that, all right? So, baptism, to be consumed, to dip, plunge... To be buried in that watery grave. So you can rise to walk in newness of life. What's another thing that we need to understand? To live once you're baptized. What, baptized? For, oh yeah, baptized for the forgiveness of sins, the remission of sins. But then the sixth step. Live faithfully. Yeah. I, that's why I was looking at you because you got that earlier. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've got it laid out on my business card. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I memorial. Right. right. I'm not 20 anymore. I need all the repetition. Yeah, and that's how we learn. And when I pass this card out and they say no or they never show up, you place this plan of salvation in their hands, brother. Yes. Would you be Would you be willing to come to services? It's all laid out right here. You can come on Sunday, 9.30, 10, 34, 5 o'clock that night, and then Wednesday at 7. Mm-hmm. Well, I want you to read the other side. Okay. Okay? That's, that's the point. Is, is to hand them that card and be sure and read the other side. Come judgment day, they cannot say nobody told them about Jesus Christ. There's a song we sing. You never mentioned him to me. Oh, yes, I did. And that's the reason why everybody, and a lot of you, got cards. Passing them out. You be sure. Because it's on the back of your card. Be sure and read the other side. Even if you have to turn it over for them. You know? They're like, oh, well. But they read it. All right. I was given a card yesterday at the funeral that I did. King Man Tong, 99 years old. His card says, wait, before you decide to throw this card away, have you wondered why there are so many churches saying and doing so many different things? And then he's got it listed here. To watch that video, why there are so many churches. Don Blackwell, excellent, excellent video. Need to watch. You need to watch. Did you have something? 
So, and then on the back, guess what he has? The plan of salvation. All right? Read the back of the card. It tells you what you need to do to be saved. All right? Now, continue in that faith, repentance, and being baptized once. You don't have to keep... If you sin, you don't have to be baptized again. You have to repent and pray that God will forgive you, confessing your sins before Him. And if you want to confess your faults, we can do it one to another. Okay? Find somebody that you can relate to and talk to them and say, hey, I'm struggling. Can you pray for me? Can you help me? You go before the congregation and you say, I need the prayers of the saints. I'm struggling. I, I, I don't know where to go and what to do. Maybe you can help me, but I need your prayers. And that's why, that's what we need to do. Now, yes, ma'am. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Because if they were baptized, you said it, they were baptized for the wrong reason. So they might have got baptized to join the church. A lot of denominations in the world, our next door neighbors do that. They, they say, well, once you say that sinner's prayer and you put the Lord on in your heart, then, then you want to be able to come because uh, next month we're going to have a big baptism day. And we're going to baptize all those that have come forward. All right? Well, they say that baptism is in the center of the salvation. The ones down here say the same thing. The ones way down there say the same thing. They say that baptism is not essential for salvation, but the Bible teaches that it is. And we're going we're to get into that a little bit more. Now, with that in mind, with that in mind, they're saying, once you accept the Lord in your heart, then you'll want to be baptized to join the church. You see? To join the church. Join. It's not a club. What is it that we understand that the Bible teaches when it comes to that aspect? The Lord adds you, Lord adds you to the church. That's right. Acts 2.47. So the Lord adds you to the church. You, you, you can't join the church. But the Lord can add you to it. So we're actually getting into his <laughs> for Galatians 3.27 for as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We get into Christ, not him getting into us. But guess where he is once we're in him? He's in us. Right. Somebody got the mic? You know, Charles, it, it don't, even in the, in the church of Christ, you cannot be right if you don't obey and be in a, in a way when you confess Christ before others. If your heart is not there, when you, uh, when you went to get baptized, then you're not right. Even if you're not in another doctrine, you could be in a, a church of the Lord, and if your heart's not right, when you obey and go for and ask for forgiveness and get baptized, if you're not, your heart is not right, then you're not going to be right. And you're not going to be in the way Christ wants you to be. You know, when I was young, you know, there was a bunch of us at church. We, you know, we were in class. We, we were hearing about the, about the word, about the gospel, about the good news. And then we, we decided, well, we want to, we want to, get baptized, but our heart wasn't there. My heart, all of us were just doing it to be doing it. 
And when I got older, I understand from some brethren that talked to me, and I realized when I got baptized, I didn't get baptized for the right reason. Okay. I was just following the crowd, and, uh, and even though, and I was in the church, Church of Our Lord, but my heart wasn't there. I was just, just doing it, you know what I'm saying? So even if you're a person, even in the church, your heart has to be right in every part of the worship or in the Lord. And that, I think Mark makes a good point. When we come before the Lord's Supper, our heart has to be right. We have to be in a right frame of mind. Or, or when we come before that, that table, that memorial, we're coming before our Lord and Savior. Because our Lord and Savior says, do this until I come. Means till he comes and takes us home. Mm -hmm. So when we come before the Lord's Supper, we're coming in a way that needs to be right. If our heart is not right, don't partake of the Lord's Supper. Because you're not going to be worthy of Amen. it. Get Amen. your heart right before you come before the t Lord's table and remember your Lord and Savior. Because your Lord and Savior wants you to be 100%. He wants you to be taking up your cross in every part of your spiritual life. You cannot be taught wrong and baptized right. You can be taught right and still, with that illustration, be baptized wrong. If your heart's not there, what, what was it that Jesus said to his disciples? He said, you need to take up the cross and follow me. Daily. Daily. Yeah, now, what is the cross that he was in reference to? What was he referring to? Your burdens. Your trials, your temptations, you need to take up that and, and get away from that and follow him and him only. All right? So, very important. But you, can be, you can't be taught wrong and baptized right. Now, those that have been baptized wrong, not according to, to what the Bible teaches for the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins, and, and as well that, that uh, you can still be rebaptized. Here's the thing, okay? And I want you to, I want to say this, and I'm going to qualify it, okay? If you were baptized for the wrong reason, you weren't baptized. Really and truly, according to God's word, if you weren't baptized for the right reason, you truly wasn't baptized. You got wet. You went in a dry center and they came out of a wet one. All right? And we don't, we don't make wet centers here. All right? So don't, don't ever make a reference that, oh, we got to get him into the baptism. We got to get him into that baptismal, baptismal pool. No. Does he have faith? Does he believe? Has he repented? Is he willing to make that good confession? Then he can be baptized for the right reason. I was going to say, uh, to piggyback off what Brother Stewart is saying, that's why Brother Charles extends the invitation so we have time enough to come down right. front before we partake of the Lord's Supper. Exactly. If you choose to sit there and not come down front and take it damnation to yourself, that's your choice. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. That was one of the main reasons why we put the sermon before the Lord's Supper. That's why I'm very adamant that when we do baptize somebody, that we don't get quick rushed into doing the Lord's Supper until that person is able to come down because they will be able to take it and it will mean something then. You see, it will mean something to them at that point. Did you know that good intentions alone 
never saved anyone. I have good intentions. But what was the old saying? Good intentions are the road to hell. Right? They could be. Someone was baptized into a denomination, believing with all his heart that he was doing what was right at that time. But if he was not baptized with an accurate biblical understanding about what was to take place at that baptism, then he could never have a pure conscience until he's baptized according to the biblical pattern. That's the key. That's the key. That's, that's what they teach, right? That you're saved and then you're baptized. My Bible doesn't teach that. No, yeah, that's right. Acts 9, 22 and 26. Paul was not saved on the road to Damascus. If anybody had good intentions, it was the Paul or Saul of Tarsus at the time. Right. He told him to go into Damascus and it will be told thee what thou must do for three days blind praying was the most miserable man if he was saved. Until Ananias came to him and said now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Acts twenty two sixteen. So According to that verse, when was his sins washed away? When he was baptized, based upon his faith, his believing that Jesus is the Son of God, his repentance. He had three days to repent and think about his situation in life of putting Christians, men and women, in the jail, having a hand in killing Stephen. He realized, I got to get this right. And that's when Ananias came to him. Calling upon the name of the Lord. That means calling there means to serve. All right. I came calling on Cindy Emery the other day. I went to serve. I brought her a wheelchair. So she'd be able to get around. You see, that... Back in the day, we used to call on people. It wasn't picking up a phone and talking to them. It was going and helping them clean out their gutters, knocking on the door, right? Whatever it might be, mowing their grass. I went to serve. I went calling on them. That, that, that's the understanding here. It's not saying something. It's doing. All right? There are just some things someone must understand before his baptism can be considered the one baptism that we read about in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, to enter into the kingdom of God. All right? So, how do you know someone is ready for baptism? How do you know someone is ready for baptism? First, I'm sorry. It's rhetorical. No, I mean, if you want to answer, I guess it would be all right. That's the question we ought to ask. How do we know someone is ready for baptism? First, to understand that baptism is a burial of the dead. Dead to what? To sin. Dead to sin. Romans 6, 3 through 11. One must be dead enough to be buried. I haven't, I, I went to a funeral yesterday. He was 99 years old. He was dead as a doornail. All right? They weren't going to bury him if he was alive. But we have to be dead to sin. A person must be eager to give up 
everything that displeases God in this life in order to be eligible for baptism. That's why, that's why when somebody comes to me and says, hey, I want to be baptized, and I'll say, why? That's my first question. Why? Why do you, why do you want to be baptized? <laughs> if they can tell me, that means I know they understand. If not, let's sit down. Let's open up the Bible and let's see what the Bible says because you're going to be judged by it. Not by what I say, as long as I'm saying it according to this, yeah. All right. But, but what the Bible teaches, you're going to be judged by that. I, I might not be standing next to you on judgment day, but it won't matter anyway. Because I'll be judged accordingly as an individual, and you will be judged accordingly as an individual, even though we're all there corporately together. I can't say or do anything to change it. Well, well Jesus, hold on, man. J Jesus, if you just knew how good a man this guy was, Jesus would say, well, he didn't obey my gospel. Oh, but he, he had good intentions. I mean, his heart was like gold. He helped everybody. He did every. He would take the shirt off his back to help you. But he didn't obey my gospel, Jesus says. Those were all good, and those are good intentions. But good intentions never saves anyone. What did he say? If you love me, keep my commandments. And guess what one of those commandments are? To have faith. To repent. To make that good confession and be baptized and live faithfully. <laughs> live faithfully. Continue in growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Right? Okay. You must be eager to give up everything that displeases God. You have to be, there you go. You have to be willing to submit to the Lord. It's, if you look at that card again, look, you look at the back. What was that top line say there? God's plan of salvation. Not Charles's. God's plan. GPS. Yeah, it's our GPS. This was something that God put in force before the foundation of the world. It was the promise that he made before the foundation of the world. Before he even created the heavens and the earth. Before he even created man who could sin. Somebody just was there and called Yeah. Yeah. About the first promise. That's right. Yeah. I always knew that it said in that verse God, which cannot lie. Promise before the foundation of the world. That's right. You're going to learn something. You're going to keep on learning until you're six feet under the ground or four feet or whatever they do now. Cremate. But it, yes, very important. If someone is not heartbroken over sin, unwilling to leave behind whatever sinful relationship or relationships and desires that he has in his or her life, then he or she is not dead enough to be buried in that watery grave and thus would not rise to walk in newness of life. Please do not just say, oh, I wish we could just get him in that baptism. Oh, I wish we could baptize more people. 
I'm, I'm not into just baptizing people. I want you to know and understand why baptism is essential for salvation. Van again. Charles, when, when Peter stood up before the people, day of Pentecost, and they asked their hearts from the teaching, the preaching of the gospel, their hearts were pricked. And they asked, what must we be doing? And that's the key. Their heart was pricked. When Apostle Paul preached, Felix asked for Paul concerning the faith in Christ. And Paul preached to him the faith in Christ. He preached about righteousness, temperance, and the judgment to come. And what, was Felix, what did Felix do when, pre, when Paul preached that to him? The same thing when Peter preached the gospel to that bunch of people that were there. Their heart, his heart was pricked, and he started to tremble. That's the key to a people sinners. When, they, when their heart is pricked, with the message from the gospel that you're talking to them, trying to get them to, when their heart is pricked, they're ready. Mm -hmm. They are ready and they're a candidate for, the, for being baptized. If their heart's not pricked, they're not ready because they haven't, they don't, it ain't affected them none. The, it's either the message that you're presenting them to them or their heart is hardened. It has no effect on it. So either the message is not strong enough or their heart is not right and they're not a candidate for the gospel. Because if, if you baptize them and their heart's not right, then they're, they're still in sin. So the message has to be in a way and present it in a way to the sinner that it pricks their heart. And they realize they are in sin. I, and you've heard me say this before, have said that is called conviction. Amen. You have to be convicted enough to understand. Oh, John, sorry. When God created us, he gave us freedom of choice. Right. And... Anytime we have freedom of choice, we're not always going to make the right choice. No. That's why we need that <laughs> avenue, avenue of yes. baptism and repentance to get through it. That's right. So, yeah, we, we're, we're, we're bound to not make the right choices in some cases, right? But many of us do make the right choice. And that's when it really counts, you see, right? Conviction. Very important. We need to know and be convicted before we can be baptized, converted. One must be ready to leave everything behind and submit, as was just said earlier, to Jesus as Lord. One must have been sanctified. What does sanctify mean? Set apart. Set apart. Set apart from what? The world to Jesus. Sanctified in his heart, Christ as Lord, 1 Peter 3.15. Unless Jesus is Lord over one's life, then he or she will eventually leave the kingdom. When persecution, pressure, pain comes. The fleeting pleasure of sin, Hebrews 11, 24 through 27, will eventually win back the heart of anyone who has not been convicted and converted truly by the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you have not made Jesus as Lord in your life, in the sense of your faith, in believing that he's the son of God 
and repentance, then the baptism hmm, ain't going to work. It's interesting that we will talk to people and they will say, well, I've been baptized. So then we have to study with them. We have to find out why were they baptized. That's really, I have a list of questions that I ask each person to fill out this sheet so that when we do study, we can then refer to that sheet. Here's what you learned from the Bible. Here's what you said that you did. Do you see where the problem areas are? Do you see what, what you need to change? You see, because it's, you have to understand. You either understand or misunderstand, right? You either understood or you misunderstood. That's, that's the point. So, Satan wants you and he will want you to think that your baptism is okay if it's for the wrong reason. Satan wants you to think, oh, you'll be all right. Don't worry about it. God will take care of you anyway. Oh, no. That's not what the Bible teaches. Jim? What you were saying leads me to the book of James, the second chapter, verse 17, where it speaks, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, is being, dead alone. being alone. So, I mean... With that faith, if you don't do anything with it, yeah. it's like the Bible says, it's dead. Faith, faith alone won't save you any more than baptism alone will save you. Any more than repentance alone will save you. But if you follow those steps, just like the steps it took for you to get into this building, if you didn't take all those steps to get into this building, you won't be in this building. Well, there's steps to the plan of salvation that God has prescribed and for us to be able to fulfill the will of God, the commands of God, the oracles of God, we have to follow those steps. And he's outlined them in the Word of God. You read the book of Acts and you'll read about nine conversions. It's called the book of conversions. And in that book, you will read about all those who were converted out of sin First by conviction, and then converted by obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel, the three facts that make it up. What? Immediately, yeah. Death, burial, and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. When we die to sin, we're buried in that watery grave, and we rise to walk in newness of life. We're portraying the very thing that Jesus did when he died on that cross, was buried in that borrowed tomb, that new tomb, but he rose on that third day, a new life. Never to die again. Okay? So, our time is almost gone. Why? It just got started. Yeah, sorry. Oh, hi, Grace. Yeah, in Acts 9, verse 9, Saul remained blind for three days. Yeah, I said that earlier. Yeah. Jesus also was buried for three days oh, I see what you're before saying. his resurrection. Yeah. Right. Is there anything we need to know about the relationship between these three days in Saul's episode and that of Christ? I, it could have some significance. I don't know. But yeah, uh, there, was, there was quite a few of those threes, threes and sevens and, and so forth in the Bible. So yeah, it, it could be. But uh, it's interesting. All right. But no, we'll, I don't want to go any further. I want us to pick this up next Wednesday. But read the book of Acts, okay? And read about those nine conversions in there and then come back and ask me the questions, okay? Because I want you to know and be convicted enough so that when you are baptized, 
you'll come up out of that watery grave a new creature, a new person, thus a New Testament Christian, and thus ready to go to heaven. And we hope that you'll do that. All right, we'll pick up from there next week. Thank you. If you would please mark your hymn books to number 348, 348, that'll be our Lord's invitation. Again, that was 348. After you've done that, if you would please turn to 254, 254, when the roll is called up yonder. We'll sing the first and third stanza. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saved on earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 the roll is called up yonder I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, And number 348 is the song of encouragement. A good question that has been asked many times. A lot of people have wondered, does God send anyone to hell? Now, before you answer, I want you to think about it. God doesn't send anyone to hell. You send yourself. He gave you the choice. All you had to do was be obedient to the right choice. If you're not, then of course, you'll go to that place called hell. That was prepared for the devil and his angels. Never was for mankind. But anything unholy cannot be in the holy presence of God. Now God did send something. And that was his own begot only begotten son. And he sent him to this place called earth to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke 19.10 The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Notice should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. 
But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed. Let me qualify that word believe because according to the Bible that means to trust and obey. If you don't believe, you won't obey. Okay? This is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because why? Their deeds were evil. John 3, 16 through 19. Three things were taught there. That God loves the world enough and has done everything he could do to save mankind. Do you believe that? I hope so. But then God also lets each person choose his belief. Whether it's light or darkness. And a person's actions reflect his or her choice. Now the one who chooses evil prefers to remain in darkness, right? Exactly. And then we also learn that man's destiny follows his decision. You see, light symbolizes good and heaven. Darkness symbolizes evil and hell. Ultimately, we live with the consequences of our choices. Sin is man saying to God throughout his life, go away and leave me alone. Hell is God finally saying to man, you may have your wish. And no, we don't want that. So if you're here tonight and not a child of God, realizing the brevity of life, how short it is, Are you willing to make that good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? It's all based upon your faith and believing that. It's all based upon your repentance of those things that you've been doing wrong and to start doing things right according to God's Word. And then being baptized in that watery grave for the remission of your sins. God's plan of salvation, not mine. And then to live faithfully as well. And so if you're here, not a child of God, obey the gospel, the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And if you are here as a child of God and you wandered off back into sin, repent of that and pray that God will forgive you. And we're here to pray with you and for you. I hope that you understand that you don't want to hear the words depart from me. I never knew you. What you want to hear is well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Heaven can be your home. And I did that funeral yesterday for a man that was 99 years old. Come October of this year, he would have been 100. And I said, and I thought this, I was thinking, oh man, if he could have just made it to October, he would have been 100. How, self, how selfish was I? You see, when he was 94, he obeyed the gospel. And if he was ready to go to be with the Lord, who cares if he would have made it to 100? He cared because he was ready to go. His health kept him from living much longer, but I'm sure he was ready to go. And I'm selfish and I'm wanting him to stay, to be 100. I shouldn't be that way. 
If he can obey the gospel at 94, who's to say that you can't at 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, whatever it might be? The time is now. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6 2, today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. Listen, Jesus is tenderly calling your name. Will you let him in as together we stand and sing? Thank you, Brother Jim. So good to see everyone here tonight. I'm glad that the rain didn't keep you from coming out. But it's so good to be able to have the rain when it does come. And so good to see you when you're able to come. But there are many that are unable to come because of sickness. Keep them in your prayers. Cindy Emery is in Gulfport Rehab Center down in Pasadena. Sandra Favor has the shingles. She also wrote us a text, and she said she would like for us to read this tonight. She said, thank you so much for the visits, the calls, the cards, the texts, the prayers on her behalf. She said they were and are appreciated. But unfortunately, as I was recovering, I contracted the shingle virus. So I continue to solicit your prayers. Thank you as my church family. Love and hugs, Sandra. And so we keep her in our prayers as she's able to get over the shingles as soon as possible as well. So she can be back here with us and, and be in fellowship once again. Carol Unteed still needs our prayers for her health issues. Ronnie Somerville taking chemo treatments. And then my wife, Teresa, for her cancer treatments. She's got a doctor's appointment tomorrow to get the results of her MRI and CT scan. Then she has an injection and an infusion tomorrow. So keep her in your prayers. And I appreciate that. She appreciates it very much. Family members and friends that need our prayer to... Teresa's dad, Charles Wright, he is back home. Everything went well with his surgery, the hernia surgery, and uh, he's on the road to recovery, and we're glad to hear that. Linda Hadsock's sister, Nellie, needs our prayers once again. Marta Core's sister for her kidney removal in April, 
and also a biopsy for the nodules in her lungs. Eve Chandler's son, Donovan, has a procedure on April 16th, and so we pray that everything will go well with him for that. Anybody else that we might have overlooked that we need to mention? Rob? Uh-oh. Okay. So remember Eve, as she is dealing with uh, a sickness, probably brought on by the medicine, and then also Delia as well, as she is uh, trying to deal with the arthritis that is in her body. Also, Bridget Barclay. Yeah. Okay, Brittany Bar Bartley, we've been, we had her down as uh, prayers for her. She started her chemo yesterday. Somebody's got a mic. I'm asking for pr prayer for my Aunt Elma Coward. She visited here before, and she lived in Albany, Georgia, and she lost her brother-in-law, so I think the husband only had one brother, and they only had one sister left. And she's your aunt? My aunt, yes. Emma? Yes. Emma? Okay. Aunt Emma. So keep her in your prayers as well. Uh, she has lost a family member. Our next ladies Bible class is Tuesday, April 16th at 10 a.m. Men's monthly Bible class is Thursday, April 11th at 7 p.m. Prayers to Jim and Val. They're going to be leaving us. They're going to be returning back to, to the wildcat, wildcat country, <laughs> Kentucky, right? And uh, they're going this Saturday. So we're going to miss them so much. And we look forward to them coming back. I always say just turn around your hat backwards and we'll think you're coming back. And, but she has uh, written something that's uh, very nice. Uh, she said the picture on the front depicts, depicts us. Uh, it's, it's an owl with uh, wide eyes. Okay. She says, thank you to all. Everyone has made us feel right at home. Your love, help, and concerns, all the great fellowship, and most of all, the great teachings of God's word. Thank you. Please be in prayer for us as we start home Saturday morning through Sunday as we travel. We love you all, Jim and Val. So we're going to miss them. But uh, hurry back. Hurry back. You gave Van the mic for closing prayer. Oh. Anything else I might have overlooked that we need to mention? Well, thank you for coming tonight. We hope that you come back Sunday at 9.30 for Bible study, 10.30 for worship, then again that night at 5 for our evening worship, then back here next Wednesday at 7 p.m. for our midweek Bible study. We're going to be have a closing prayer. Brother Van Stewart will lead us in that closing prayer, and you'll be dismissed. Let us pray. Dear our Father, who sit in heaven, I be thy high and glorious name. Dear our Father, we're so thankful this midweek Bible study that we had for the edification that we draw from the lesson, for the thoughts to help us to center our mind upon what is in hand, that is striving to be a light for thy son here on this earth. Dear and Father, we're so thankful for all the many blessings we have through our Lord and Savior. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're so thankful for that continued blood that helps us when we're weak and when we, when we fall short of thy glory, and when we sin and fall into the traps of Satan, for he is after us every minute of the day. We're so thankful for that blood that cleanses us and helps us to be, again, restored. We hope and pray, dear our Father, that we will realize how important it is to have that blood of our Savior 
in our lives by obeying the gospel and to continue to live faithfully here on this earth. We hope and pray that we'll strive to study thy word and apply it to our lives, not just when we come and meet with the brethren here as a body of Christ at Central, but help us to have that kind of mind that we will want to study thy word every day that we have to keep us strong and to help us strengthen us in our trials that we have in our environments that we live in from day to day. Dear and Father, we know that a lot of our brethren are mentioned and are needing our prayers. We have hope and pray that we'll bless Sister Cindy and Sister Sandra and be with Sister Maddie and her family. And dear our Father, strengthen them, however thou knows how, for thou knows our needs before we even ask. But we hope and pray that we'll recover and be stronger and that you would comfort them in a way that only knows how through thy word, dear our Father. And may we do our part, dear our Father, as our brothers and sisters. Dear our Father, be with Sister Val and Brother Jim as they travel back to Kentucky. And we're gonna miss them so much for we're thankful, so thankful for their edification that they gave us while they're here. Please bless them in their journeys. And we hope we pray that they will want, if we're found, be able to, they'll be able to come back and be with us, Lord willing. Dear and Father, we know we had visitors here tonight. And we hope we pray they see God here and see Christ Jesus living in us and want to be part of what we're doing here as being faithful Christians to the New Testament doctrine that we have and want to be part of it and be a light for it. And bear Father, please forgive us for our sins and please bring us back at the next point in time and all these things we ask in love and name, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Amen.